Welcome. Oh, this is cozy. Huh? I know. It's <laughs> so cozy. You're lucky I'm little. <laughs> Welcome to Lisbon. Uh, bon dia. This is going to be a panel about ICOs, initial coin offerings, uh, which a, a phrase we probably didn't even hear about um, less than a year ago, most of us. And it's also going to be the venture capital VC perspective on initial coin offerings. So we have a powerhouse panel here. Fortunately for me, that means that I don't have to do a lot of talking. And I want to get right into it because we have 30 minutes. Um, so we've already been introduced to the panel. ICOs go back even before Ethereum to the first formal ICO would have been uh, MasterCoin, uh, done uh, off of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, since then, we've had a slew of ICOs. We've had investments in the, in the billions of dollars that have surpassed uh, traditional venture capital investments in the space uh, uh, year to date. And it, it, it's, been an amazing, uh, it's been an amazing stretch. ICOs um, have been referred to as uh, having your uh, exit before you even begin. Uh, they've been referred to as, uh, as pure unlicensed capitalism. And what I want to hear from the panel today is I'm going to get right into the first question so you can think about who's going to answer it. I don't have any order. Uh, I know why ICOs are good for the startups because there's minimal registration, potentially minimal regulation, and they're not selling equity. Now, why are they potentially a good thing for investors, though? So um, I think that what they're great for is society, because each of you don't have to go through us to get your money. Um, and this is a great opportunity for you uh, to go try a new angle and a new way. And, and it's a way of going straight to an investor. What I would make sure that you do, though, is warn the investor that they're investing, that they're buying a coin that may or may not have any value, is not tied to the success of your business, but is tied to how far out it will spread, um, how big a network effect you will create. That is the value of these coins. That's how they spread, and that's how they grow in value. And they, they also have to have a, a purpose. So if you're going to do an ICO, I highly recommend that you're thinking in terms of something that will transform society, that, that's a movement, that spreads the, the good word, uh, that, that there's a reason to have this coin, and it's not just like a baseball card collection. Um, and I think you've got to also understand and think about whether you're going to include, <clears throat> whether it's just going to be high net worth individuals, or you're going to include the individual investor that can come as a two-edged sword. They're easier to raise money from, but they are, they are quick to sue uh, if you have a problem. So just make sure that you're, you've thought through all of these things before you have any kind of so, an ICO. So Tim, is that what they mean by uh, protocol token? Is that it's, it's something that is uh, useful in the, um, in, in the commerce that the company is undertaking? When, when they say a protocol token. It's got to have, um, it's, they've labeled them in a couple of different ways. They're the, the what do they call it, the purpose token, the protocol token, and then the security right. token. Um, I think you first figure out what kind of a token you're going to have, but make sure there's a use for it at the end. Is someone actually going to spend it on something? Uh, do you have a like a cycle created of how people are going to buy it and how people are going to sell it. And does that all make sense? So all those things um, have to really come together for you. This is a major opportunity for all of us in society. We used to just have the 
for-profit, the non-profit, and they were two different ways. The for-profit was owned by the shareholders, the non-profit owned by society. Now we have a new thing, and it opens up the creativity of all of those minds out there, and it can do great things for our society. So uh, go, pursue it, make it great, uh, and disintermediate us. Okay, so, but <coughs> Jeff or Doc? I'll, I'll counter a little bit. I mean, I, I do believe it's 1994 all over again that the transitional phase we're going to see we have not yet experienced in our lifetime in terms of the potential access to capital. But in terms of types of tokens, utility tokens, security tokens, I'm actually doing a, a venture fund which issues security tokens and we're tokenizing limited partnership units to enable uh, li the liquidity events for people who are LPs who want to get out, which is a different type of way of doing things. Uh, the, the ability for us to go beyond the hype uh, because there's a lot of noise that's happening out there. I believe two years from now, the majority of in initial coin offerings or token generating events that you read about will be security tokens, whereby municipalities, whereby Fortune 500 companies, instead of doing another debt offering or a city worrying about taking on more debt, they will actually do something like there was the New York City subway token. There, there actually are token economies that are natural in governments, in municipalities, uh, as well as in businesses. And that while we cannot apply the token economy to everybody, there are natural fits. And so if, you're, if, you're, if you are two guys in a garage who want to be fraudsters, the government will eventually catch up with you, um, eventually. Um, if you're doing things with merit where you, have a, where you are creating a token and you need, and there's a purpose for that token and cannot be used, there's not an existing token that also can serve that same purpose, um, there's value there. As an investor, uh, I look for pre-ICO opportunities. So I, I encourage people to do an equity round to get the money they need in order to have an MVP so when they go to market and they do their ICO, they actually have a functioning product with a proof of concept that shows the need if they're going the utility token route or for that matter, the security token route. But, but Jeff, mo most of the tokens that are being issued now are not security tokens. So how do we get from where we are now to, to your world of security tokens? Well, if you want to violate SEC rules very quickly, because if you have uh, certain celebrities going out and endorsing products uh, without disclosing any type of relationships to the products they're, disclosed, they're representing and it turns out they had a relationship, that's a violation of SEC rules. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who actually believes in dialogue with government no matter, what the, what, no matter where you are in the world. And that if the biggest risk at hand is if you have a utility token and the way it was issued was not kosher, you end up with a security token. Okay, those are jurisdictional issues and we're definitely gonna get to those. Um, Jalik? Sure, so I have been investing in the blockchain space since 2013 and as you noted, the um, kind of ICO phenomenon is a fairly new one. <laughs> um, uh, while you know, Ether and MasterCoin had, had ICOs and we've had a, a sprinkling of them, it's really in the last uh, six to eight months that we've seen you know, hundreds of, of tokens being offered. So it does remind me very much of when I was investing in Silicon Valley in the late 90s around the, the internet boom and then the mobile app boom um, you know, in the 2000s um, where you know, people are viewing this as, as a way to raise capital um, in, in, in a quick way in uh, up until very recently a highly unregulated way. Um, and uh, you know, investors, I mean, we live in a world where um, you know, uh, it, it's hard to get alpha returns. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for global capital to, to kind of, you know, access um, an investment class that was unregulated and, and um, emerging. Uh, and I'm a big believer in what the token economy is going to achieve um, in, you know, in the next 10, 20 years. However, I'd say like 95, percent of what I'm seeing kind of issued or contemplated just doesn't make sense from a business model perspective. Um, I have several portfolio companies uh, in, in the fund that have done ICOs and actually very successful ICOs that make sense um, from a business model perspective. So Civic is an example of one. Um, they did an equity uh, ser series seed round in 2015. Uh, the founder of Vinnie Lingam um, is, uh, he had sold gift to First Data. 
Um, and he saw a world where we could use blockchain technology to offer decentralized identities. So you know, every time um, we give our we open a bank account or uh, apply for a loan, we have to give our social security number uh, out. And you know, as we've seen in the U.S. with the Equifax hack, all of that information is very vulnerable. So he wanted to decentralize the storage of, of our personal data and, and then get, allow users to get notified every time that social security number is being used or our home address is being used. And so we would get alerts around that. So that's a real utility. Um, and I think that's one that makes sense. And he also put a cap on his ICO. It was $33 million. He was vastly oversubscribed, but um, you know he's run companies before, and he wanted to be kind of very um, deliberate and disciplined about the use of funds and and what it meant for the token holders. Well, why why do you think that ICOs are here to stay, and it's not just a uh, a temporary flash in the pan? Well, I, I think you know to date we have not been able to allow kind of part all participants in an economy to, I mean, I, I'm calling them participants, but um, participants of people who give data, give information, who contribute to the economy, not everyone has been able to get value back. Um, and I just think about Facebook um, and, and the amount of personal information we're constantly giving up. And I, I'm no longer on Facebook. I got off after a bad hack um, about nine months ago. Um, I'm and off I, as well. I've never been happier. <laughs> but but they, um, they're they monetizing to the tune of, you know, billions of dollars of, of um, you know, advertising revenue, abusing our information. And, and what are we getting in return? We're getting really badly retargeted ads. We're getting, you know, the Russians trying to influence our elections. Um, and, and that's been, you know, that, there's a trust mechanism that is broken um, with the way kind of business is done right now. And, and I do believe that a token economy can address that, where the people who are participating, contributing, developers, citizens, um, can actually kind of receive value back, and, 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 and it's in a currency that they, they personally care about. OK. All right, I want to, um, I want to shift it to regulation a little bit. Uh, we, we all hear in the news uh, every once in a while some country, China recently bans ICOs. Uh, the U.S. comes out with, with warnings and guidance. Uh, Jeff mentioned the SEC. I mean, ultimately, I've always said that uh, China banning ICOs is bad for Chinese citizens. It's not necessarily bad for the rest of the world. And I would say the same for the U.S., that uh, U.S. Uh, uh, regulatory crackdown on ICOs would only be detrimental to U.S. citizens, except for the people who are outside the U.S. It's, raising it's from. Not so, it's not so much just for uh, regulation. We need best practices for how an ICO is constructed. We need best practices for token construction. We need best practices for the accounting of ICOs. There are billionaires sitting out there in the ether without the understanding of how to go to fiat because there are no understandings right now of generally accepted, accepted accounting principles anywhere in the world that, that understands that. We have, we're entering a new era of commerce. We're in perhaps the fourth wave of, of, of industrial revolution. And in, in that, the rules have shifted. The rules have changed. And so it's, the SEC is one side of it. There are banking issues to deal with. But we have lifestyle. I have friends of mine that have multi, they're millionaires in their, in their wallets, but they don't buy coffee because they don't have fiat. And they're scared to cash in. And, and so we have these other issues in terms of what happens when we all live in Gotham City, when we can't get it outside. We do, there's so much opportunity today for entrepreneurs to provide on-ramps and off-ramps from both sides of that, but we have to understand how crypto is handled. We also, I think, need to get rid of the negative connotation associated with crypto. For some reason, people think crypto, they go to dark web. They don't think necessarily angels in paradise. And, and you know, if someone's gonna have a crypto meetup, let us pay with an alternative coin. We shouldn't have to use fiat for it. You know, there, there's a whole idea out there that regulation gives us guidance. Regulations will stop consumers from having their savings taken away, hopefully. But, but, we, but, but you, you didn't hear my see, question I yet. Think, I think <laughs> this is, I look at it an entirely different way. I think that all the countries of the world don't 
really get it yet. The governments of the world don't really get it yet, but they are in competition for you. They have a new, regu a new opportunity here with all of a sudden there's, there's a, a whole new technology that's going to transform real estate, transform insurance, everything, finance. It's going to transform government. And they are looking and saying either they're threatened by it in China's case where they go, we've got to put a, a wall around China and we've got to protect ourselves from this dangerous new thing, or the countries like Japan who go, hey, we need entrepreneurs. Let's make Bitcoin legal here. Let's, in fact, make it a, a nationally recognized currency. Let's encourage ICOs. Japan is, has basically made it so that all, there will be a huge exodus out of China. All the entrepreneurs are going to leave China because they're going to say, hey, this is the coolest technology ever. Uh, why would I stay in a country that says it's illegal when right in Japan, you know, not far away, I can go set up shop and I can do it and, they, and the government's encouraging me. Which is and fortunately, I think uh, the U.S. has been very accepting and they're letting it happen and they're bringing people in. So the U.S. is going to be a beneficiary. South Korea says, no, no ICOs here. They're supposed to be the free part of Korea. I don't get it. What are they thinking? A free, freedom encourages wealth. If you're a free country, you get a wealthy country. I don't get why the free part of Korea is suddenly saying no to ICOs. That's like saying we're going to keep our country and our citizens in the dark for the next 20 years. Instead of saying, bring the greatest entrepreneurs here, we're going to see amazing things develop, we're going to see great things happen, we're going to really make uh, our country great. And uh, fortunately, the U.S. is saying, we're going to accept it. I, uh, the, the SEC has been very quiet. They've been sort of saying, okay, well, as long as you're not messing with the Howley rules, we're okay. And, uh, and then, you, then you see, like, Singapore, I mean, you start with Switzerland, and you, and you see that they have the cat by the tail. This is the coolest thing. Everybody's doing their ICOs through Switzerland through this really convoluted legal structure. All of our Swiss lawyers are getting rich. All the money's coming through Switzerland. And then what do they do? They regulate. They ruin the whole thing so people go to Singapore. And then Singapore is doing the same thing, and then they're going, well, what do they do? They regulate, and so everybody goes to Cayman. Now they're going to the U.S. and Japan, and we've got to, I mean, what's going to happen here is countries are going to say no to ICOs, and then people and money and businesses are all going to leave those countries and go to the ones that are encouraging ICOs. Okay, I, I think Jeff wanted to add wanted something to there. Jump in. I wanted to, to, to reiterate, um, uh, Tim's point, though, in Japan, where there's a boom, what's going on, the g Japanese government did come out with regulations, and people were worried about what was going to happen, but it turns out after a, com a country comes out with the regulations, all of a sudden, wow, now they understand the, the code of conduct. Now they understand what's going to happen. Well, and that's what started the Bitcoin price rise right. in, in and, and, March. And, and, and that, it was and, and, Japan and, um, actually putting in some regulations so that people co had guidance. It provides yeah. guidance. And once yeah. you have guidance, now you could actually look at this as a commodity outside of the world of crypto. And you look beyond that, and, and we have vast opportunities for creation of wealth uh, in many ways. One issue that does come up, however, is on exchanges whether or not best practices are for anti-money laundering and to know your customer. A lot of people come in, come out, and they're anonymous. One of the issues that will be raised in the next two years, I believe, around the world with regulators is to prevent money laundering, because we do not necessarily facilitate, I'm certainly not in favor of using crypto for money laundering or for, let's call it, bad things. So as a society, as a world, we need to figure out how to encourage amazing achievements at the same time to provide in some, some controls so that we don't accidentally do things. Uh, friends of mine have consulted, though, with the Bank of England. I was my utter amazement to realize that during the Brexit time, uh, because of what's happening in, in the UK, uh, the Bank of England is, is, is very close to doing a digital currency. And their idea is that if you don't register your currency with them, 
you will have one half of 1% of your net wealth disappear. Because they can do that. Yeah, so I, I, for the last two to three years, I've been very engaged with uh, regulators all over the world around blockchain technology and, and Bitcoin and, and now ICOs. And, um, and, and what I found is that they have been very interested in just learning more about this technology. Yes, they've heard the negative views on um, you know, how it's being used for money laundering, nefarious purposes. But uh, you know, I view my role very much as like educating them on this, the benefits to their societies, um, as well as, quite honestly, a way to you know, crack down on some of this nefarious activity. Um, and, and I believe regulation, if done in the right way, is, is a good thing. Uh, I, I think it's very important if we want this technology to benefit society that we have to make sure it doesn't get co-opted by bad actors. And, and we've seen that happen in, in some of these jurisdictions. We've seen a bunch of fraud in the ICO market. And I, I personally kind of welcome um, smart language uh, from regulators, and I think the SEC is in that category, um, uh, when, when their goal is to kind of root out the bad activity so we can get to the real benefits of, of right, the technology. But, ag agreed, but, but don't you think also that the, the countries that are pushing away uh, the ICO industry, and, and I'm not even willing to say that the uh, U.S. isn't there yet, they, they might not just be there yet, but don't they risk pushing that ICO industry to jurisdictions like Gibraltar, uh, Switzerland? Uh, the same thing that happened with online gaming in the in sure. the last decade, where they yielded that business to to more welcoming jurisdictions. Isn't sure, that a major sure. risk? Sure. I mean, I, I think absolutely that is a major risk. But I, I think we've also learned from the past, right? And 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 I don't at least when I look at the U.S. regulators, I don't see them wanting to clamp down. Uh, on on something that is innovative and actually could be helpful to you know the financial industry in, in certain ways, right? Um, and and so absolutely, I mean China. I mean we're seeing huge exodus of, of great entrepreneurs who had moved to China to help build this sector, who are now going to Japan and and going um, uh, some of them coming to the U.S. actually, and 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 so. As we start to see that, I think governments are going to keep monitoring that. This technology cannot be shut down. Uh, I mean, it, it, China proved that. I mean, the, the Bitcoin price went down very slightly and then jumped back up after China banned I think, uh, cryptos. I think, so. I think governments regulate or over-regulate at their own peril. Exactly. I think it's like short-term fixing. It's like put a ban, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, your leg's broken, you put a Band-Aid on it. I, I think it's, you, you've got to think in terms of like, how do we make sure that we attract these people? This is the group. This is among the great entrepreneurs of the world, the people who are going to make things happen, things that are really going to change. How do you attract this group? You keep regulations to a minimum. You let them fly. You let them figure it out. And then maybe, like way down the road, if there's some problem, you kind of go, okay, well, that went a little too far, and maybe you have to do something. But generally, it's better to incentivize people to do things and try things than incentivize people to just sit there and do nothing. And, I, and it, you, you know, you can create all the regulations you want. You're, the more you, the more regulations you create the less likely people are going to be willing to do anything. And that's why more regulation means worse economy, poor citizens, all of that. And less regulation means wealthy country, great innovation, uh, new, new inventions, new thinking, new ways of life, uh, great things. I, I, do, I do believe in our, our lifetime we may find a country to go so much in that favor that it will, will be the crypto nation. That, yeah, that, that and, it, and it'll attract It will attract them. everybody because it will be crypto friendly, it will be, it will be light regulation if at any, and it will be a hub for innovation because it can happen. I was talking to friends of mine about how... I, you know, I do own an island in yeah. Tanzania and I'm thinking about We just about have to this. make a, a payment to the Tanzania <laughs> government so that you're autonomous from it. Right. So then you could actually be your island. I, I think that is possible, that we're living in times when those crazy things can and will happen. 
and that changes everything. You know what I think so, is so happening. Then, I, I would love to then hear about how um, how that benefits. So how does that contribute back to maybe you know the, the, the parts society? of the world that are yeah. are are regulated? Yeah, and, well, yeah. Okay. Well, here's here's what's really interesting yeah. is that with this new crypto world and with the blockchain, we actually can govern ourselves in new ways that, are, that transcend our existing governments. Those governments are all tied to land bases. We can move. They're trapped in their land base. You'll change they, that. We can change all that. Um, what, what do governments do? A lot of what they do is keep track of you and give you insurance. Well, all those things can be done. You can have your medical insurance. You can be. You can keep perfect track of everyone. You can. Um, you can provide pensions. You can do all that stuff, in in the blockchain. And that means that government, as it stands now, is way too heavy. It's going to fall under its own weight if governments don't innovate and try. To move in this new so, direction. So everyone's going to move to your island in, in Tanzania. We, we right see now. they don't have to okay. because citizens. they can be virtual citizens. citizens. In fact, I have decided you are all now virtual <laughs> citizens Thank you. of the <laughs> island of Lupita. <laughs> Welcome. You heard it here first. Welcome to our world. This is a global citizenry. I would like to give a shout out to my friends in the Cayman Islands today. They're doing the ICO for Storm. They, they're watching us, and I say, go storm, because it's, it's crazy, right? We go to places, people dream big. I believe people will just dream bigger today. It can happen. You know, I think this is all great. I also uh, want to really think about the next few years and, and kind of the transition to that world. And, and there are a lot of amazing use cases that we can work within the frameworks we have. And, and one is a project that's being done with refugees. Mm -hmm. um, in Syria, where their aid is, or re Syrian refugees, um, and where their aid is being distributed through Ethereum wallets, and there, you know, all these places in the world where there's fraud or no, lack of identity, you know, a billion and a half people around the world without any form of uh, national or government ID, um, being able to kind of br start bringing some of those citizens. Um, into kind of the global GDP to contribute and benefit um, from the um, kind of growth that we're seeing around the world. And, and that's, you know, that's really my focus over the next few years. I do want to live, you know, in a world that, you know, we, we've seen described here. But there are some very kind of tactical, like real world examples that are happening right now that are making people's lives better around the world. Thank you. I you yes, got a final all, word, Tim? All of the refugees are also now a part <laughs> of Lupita Island. And they are, they're all going to be a, a part of this uh, virtual residency. I, I think now, I think another thing's going to happen in government, and that is gov federal governments are going to be much less relevant than local governments. Federal governments are, are land-based and they cover lots of different cities and towns and weird strike and and they were there set up so that just in case somebody came over the border with a tank there there would be an issue well now it, most of the wealth is being created in this virtual world and by the way most of the i mean in 5 years you're going to be um, you're you're going to laugh at people who are still dealing in fiat currencies I think, uh, I think we got to end it there, Tim. Okay, but, um, good. Well, hey, I, this I is fun, say, huh? I wanted to say, uh, just to, to close, though, uh, you, you, no one wants to be the last country on the planet that's banning <laughs> cryptocurrencies, just like you don't want to be the last country on the planet that, that bans Uber. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, please join me in thanking the, the talented panel. Hey, that was fun. We, get, we should spend some time Take thinking this road. whole thing through. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs>